So now we're going to start with uh, our conference today with a keynote from a remarkable man who has been recognized internationally for his community-based work in clean energy transformations, Soren Hermansen of Samsu Island in Denmark. Um, uh, so Samsu and Soren were recognized by the UN for their work. Now, in addition to his work on Samsu's clean energy transformation, uh, Mr. Hermansen is director of the Samsu Energy Academy, works with thousands of people from around the world every year on how they can move their communities forward in terms of climate change. And um, frankly, he has received so many recognitions that it would simply take up the rest of the conference to share it with them with you. So um, no one embodies climate community based climate action more than Soren Hermanson. So um, it's afternoon for you, Soren, right? So good afternoon. We are so thrilled to have you kick off our Net Zero Conference. Soren? Thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Oh, you have to, you have to, you have to switch me on as uh, on my video. So the host uh, need to start my video, I think. Are we there now? Yes, good. You are there and we can see you. Hello, it's so great to see you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's good to be here. I like the I like the idea. Um, so hi from Denmark and from Samsø. I'm Søren Hammonsen and I'm uh, the manager or the director of the Samsø Energy Academy. And I'm here. <laughs> I think I think we started a video of a, a pre-recorded yes. video, but I, but I'm here live now. Is that better? Yes, live is so live. much better. Go okay. do it. Thank you. All right, I'm good. So thank you for having me. I'm. A, it's afternoon in Denmark, and it's sunny and nice outside, and really mild. I mean, my grass is still growing. It should be has stopped for a long time and gone into winter hibernation, but uh, climate climate change has kicked in here as well. Um, I'm looking forward to make make my my introduction here and and uh, talk about what we did on Samsø and how we can how can how we can exchange this. It's very interesting also that this conference has led to me re reconnect with people from your area um, where I was and many years ago. I was on Marta's Vineyard talking about uh, kind of the prehistory of, of Cape Cod wind and some of the other things here also. So, so, so there's a lot of connections here. Are we um, in presentation mode now? Can you see this? Is it good? I guess so. Yes. Yes. So, so my so my history is that I'm from Samsø, which is called Denmark's Renewable Energy Island. We won a competition a long time ago in 1998 to be the Danish Energy Island and prove that we could convert to renewable energy in just time, 10 years. Uh, we were announced by this, uh, by, we're having this award by the Danish Minister of the Environment, Mr. Sven Augen, the late Mr. Sven Augen, who went to Kyoto and promised Denmark would reduce 21% of the CO2 emission, uh, two emission on the on the, those uh, data in those days. We won the competition to be this model island to prove that it was possible to do that. And I'm not going to into, into details technically how we did it, but maybe give you some background about why we, we took that, that challenge on, on Samsø. I come from a historical central place in the Viking age, people came to Samsø. It was centrally in Denmark and, and our history, it kind of is, is full of Viking, um, the graves and 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 mounds and, and places that reminds us that we have a history here also with people who were very very brave in long boats they traveled around the world and they did a lot of very interesting things we can dig up in history today i think we're still on these endeavors and and, and trips around the world where we try to find out where we come from and where we're going and what we can learn from other people and i think this is also some of the of the lesson learned in the process that we are still kind of is exploring and doing whatever we can to make the best out of it and try to be in the green lead of the world to, to prove that it's possible to address climate change and do something about it in, in practice in a community. Samsø is a long island seen from my perspective. It's 30 kilometers long, so maybe it's a speck of, of land in, in your perspective. It is a, it is a small place uh, in, in, in the world, but still we feel that we are in the center of the world. It's 23 little villages and we are kind of densely populated and still in this area, we needed to put in wind turbines and solar panels and district heating and change the whole system from being depending on imported fuel from outside and start using um, locally produced uh, resources. 
we basically had a problem then because we were closing down local companies and we lost jobs in hundreds and we were kind of in a depression and we thought what what is going to happen here if we don't change that destiny and that's kind of downfall in in culture and social relations because uh, all the best friends we have they are moving away because they can't keep a job here so the job situation the local development situation was was in danger so the green transition was also addressing this problem problem by saying we need to find out how we can be independent from the economy that is ruling now, which is a centralized structure that is depending on oil and fossil fuels, to be more decentralized and local so we can we can improve the local economy and create the jobs we needed here and create kind of a growth pattern that, that helps us. Uh, because we're pretty much alone out here in the middle of the Kattegat, which is the ocean between Jutland and Sealand um, in Samsø, more, more or less like you. I grew up on a farm. I'm sorry about this uh, picture because I mean I'm. <laughs> it's a long time ago. I have to admit that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grown up now. But I, I I took my green certificate and I learned how to milk cows and drive tractors and and combines and 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 work out this also. And I think it comes in handy today because I know how to fix a wind turbine. I know how to to do things and I actually know where I'm from. And I think it's very important also that my history kind of reminds me of what is necessary and what is. What, what you have to do. I mean, you have to get up in the morning to milk the cows. There's something that comes before your own uh, well-being. Uh, and I think that is also the, the, the culture of the island. We work hard to stay alive, to stay alive and, and it comes a lot from, from a farming culture that has been here a long time. It could be a fishing culture as well, but I came from a farm. My own son grew up in a shadow of a small wind turbine. So in the 80s, I was part of a co-op owned little wind turbine in my neighborhood. Uh, this is actually my property and uh, the turbine is on my land and we shared it 20 families we bought this wind turbine and my son he's the little naked boy here and the, the blonde guy in the in, in, in the middle he he grew up with wind turbines and me being uh, connected to wind development sustainable development and samsung development and he's actually still blaming me you never really taught me how to drive a tractor and milk a cow uh, and these basic uh, skills is uh, is maybe more important than, than knowing how to how to run a wind turbine, but I think he he is he's the next generation, and they are thinking different ways also. We we learned very quickly that it's about the commons administrated by community. So commodities was a new word we try to use here. Also, this is a, in any translation of of the terms we try to use. So commons is an old value, access to water, access to firewood, access to fishing grounds and stuff like that was shared by community before kind of private privatizing and private ownership, this was vital for a community to have access to resources. And we kind of look upon the, the, the situation also seen from the point of view that we are looking into a green uh, economy now where wind, solar, and biomass is also kind of commons we can harvest and use instead of importing fuel from outside and, and depend on, on external prices. We can now define our own we can call it circular economy or administration of the economy when it, when it comes to energy. And that is a really interesting uh, thing. I mean, especially in times when Putin is uh, threatening the world order and he's, he's revved up the prices on energy uh, totally. We can now handle our own energy prices because we administrate them ourselves and we're not depending on Russian gas at all, which is, which is also interesting seen from a, a global political aspect. Human beings exist in language, conversation, stories, and narratives. Human beings invent their worlds with conversations and actions, and organizations are networks of conversations and commitments for taking action and producing results. I mean, these are kind of lectures from a guy called Manuel Manga from, from uh, I think he's from, from uh, Stanford or from the university in, in, in out in the West. But he is a Col Colombian, and he's, he's the leader of something called the Evolutionary Leadership Inst Institute. And we we took a lot of his lessons into kind of the way we organize things here also, that we are telling stories about what we want, where we come from, and why we are going to do whatever we are going to take on as, as, as project here also. And when we have told this several times, it becomes the narrative of the community. So we think we are part of this process because we've heard the story and we can actually take part in some parts of that story also. We become participants in the narrative about us and who we, we live here. And I think that is a very strong message also that communication is vital for this to happen in an organized and structured way where people feel connected and not disconnected from a top-down administration, but much more a decentralized local development where we have our own say in many of the things that is 
happening here, but we also have a greater acceptance of things we don't really like, but we understand why it's there. We have a compass we work from, a place we call here. Here, it could be in your place, it could be in Massachusetts, it could be on Cape Cod, but here for us is Samsø. Where and what is your here is a question. And from there, what do we want? That is a change. What do we do? That is the action. Who are we? That is the local community. And what can we do? That's kind of the vision of this also. So every time we start a new project, we actually go from a central point of here where we can say us and we. And from there, we try to make the plan so we connect people from, the, from, from, from vision to, to, to action in, in, a, in a very direct and very, what do you call it, open way. We, we successfully make this transition in just in less than 10 years, we converted the whole energy infrastructure to renewable energy. We invested more than almost 100 million, which, 100 million Danish, no, 100 million US dollars worth of energy installations just shared by 3,400 or a little, 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 little bit less than 4,000 people. So it's a lot of money per capita. Maybe in your money, I, I, I'm translating as I speak, uh, 20,000 US dollars per capita investment in energy infrastructure. And that was possible because we could make the savings, we could sell energy, we could, we could compare the prices with the existing oil prices. And because oil prices was always going up step by step, we could, we could reduce the payback time on all the investment and therefore successfully make the installation we needed. We have onshore wind according to how much energy we use electricity wise per year. We have offshore wind turbines, 10 offshore wind turbines that is producing the equivalent of our, our total transport emissions. We have the district heating that replaced oil furnaces in houses. And we have a lot of saving and, and intelligent energy systems that is taking care of the rest. Uh, heat pumps or, or air conditioning systems is a big thing also because we need space heating uh, like half of the year more or less. Uh, so that also takes a lot of energy. We insulated houses, we put a new in, in window, so, so we brought down the energy consumption per square meters radically to be able to kind of meet the goals that we took on here also. So success, and we did it, which was also why we are recognized worldwide, because we can prove that we didn't just talk about it, we also did it. What is Samsø like? I mean, I think it's the most beautiful place in the world. I don't know if you agree. Uh, you might think that the cave, the cave is, uh, <laughs> is even more beautiful or something similar, but I, I think that is a local thing. You really, if you love your place, then it, it is the most beautiful place. And nevertheless, we had to put up wind turbines in that beautiful area. So here is a very early morning picture looking to the east where the sun is just about to break the horizon. And we see three wind turbines, one megawatt wind turbines in the horizon. And they are only like in two or three kilometers away. And and still you can see them. And I really like this picture because in the, in the to the left of the wind turbine on the right, you see smoke coming out of a smokestack. That is a nearby power station on mainland Denmark. And we are surrounded by power station that used to have to use coal. And, 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 uh, and when they went over to gas, uh, natural gas, which is also fossil fuels, and they send out quite a lot of pollution. We saw a lot of, uh, of acid rain uh, on some, so the lime level went down. We had to add more lime to the soil to keep a good production here also because of the acidic rain from the power stations. So you could say that the argument for the local people was to say, what if we, we use the metaphor that these turbines are ventilators that ventilates the CO2 and the carbon emissions away from the island and not... Uh, not allow it to, to enter the island, which is of course not true, but, but it, it is reducing the emission from the power station because we produce green energy, feed it into the grid, and therefore we actually are guilty of a reduction of the pollution. So we live with the wind turbines because they make sense to us. We understand why they are there. They are not just disturbing the landscape, they are also cleaning up the environment. An experiment doesn't have to be perfect. Experiments can open the way for something radically new. It's a sentence we use quite often also because, I mean, local communities can be quite conservative and don't really want change. We know we need them, but I mean, who wants to change if things are working? But we also have deep embedded in our souls that we need to do something radical to be a little bit in the forefront. So we have to invite experiments and understand that it might fail or it might not be as I expect it to be, but it opens up for a discussion about how do we organize structure and, and plan for the future. Common ground, different reasons is another quote. Common ground is kind of 
natural when you live on an island that you have the same area you're looking into the same perspective but you have many different reasons to be there you can be a farmer you can be a teacher you can be a, an environmentalist or you can be a politician or whatever and then you have many different reasons but you're looking into the kind of the same reason for being there but from different perspective and i think that is very interesting to study and use in the discussion about the future and the planning of the structure we have we have taken on here uh, and understand that the hippies on one side, they love to have change because it saves the world. And the business guy on the other side, they like to be in, involved because they, they might have a chance to earn some money on it. Which is both sides is good. We need both parties, but we need to, to, to sit them around the same table and have the discussion uh, simultaneously. So the island is like this, it's north and south. In the middle, we have a nature area, which is highly protected bird migration area. This is, we can't do anything there. You can't build a house. You can't put in a new window in the existing houses. You cannot put any wind turbines, solar panels up in that area at all. So, and the North Island is, is too small. So it's all in the south end of the island, which is in the bottom of the picture. That's due south. So this is where, the most of the action is this is also the most cultivated farming area so by then you can actually have like 180 degrees horizon where you see nothing but some sort of nature and landscape you can turn around and then you can see some wind turbines in the distance but you have a lot of space where you see nothing but but na nature and 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 structure of, of land and sea and ocean and stuff like that and i think that is nice because you don't fill up the, the visual uh, area with, with installations, but you have also kind of a feeling of tranquility and, and, and peace uh, when you look the other direction. Seen from the, some, from the perspective of centralizing, this is Denmark. If you can see the, the, the landmass on the right-hand side of in the upper corner, there's Sweden and below uh, you have Germany. So this is Denmark. And as you see, Samsø is right in the center of Denmark. Of course, people who live on Samsø know what we are the center of Denmark. People from the capital, which is Copenhagen, much closer to Sweden, believe they are the center, but they are so so wrong. I mean, we are obviously the center. Like the European Union, they also believe that Brussels is the center, but you can see in this uh, beautiful image that uh, Samsø is the center of Europe as well. And if you see the world, I mean, we are, I mean, funny enough, also the center of the universe. Uh, I, I don't know if you knew that in Cape Cod, but but uh, I mean, I, I proved my case here, I hope. <laughs> But I, but I think apart from the joke, it, it, is, it is very important for us to understand that we have to be in the center of our own universe to be able to make the next brave step into the future and, and, and be able to, to involve ourselves in this endeavor. It's too easy just to leave it to the global, what do you call it, uh, discussion to the UN and the UN development goals and all these other things. You have to, to bring it back to your own community and be the center and take the next brave steps from there. Power without love is coarse and ruthless. Love without power is sentimental. It's another quote from something we call the Pioneer Guide. And you can probably see it uh, in our website. It is, it is a handbook for our local community, community development. And we have learned a lot from this, this process. We have try, tried to kind of boil it down and condense it into these quotes here. So this, this is also a quote we sometimes use when we talk to people. We look around and we can see who are the hippies in the room and who are the business guys. And then we try to, to keep them in these roles and say to them, it's so good that we have somebody who are visionaries and who wants to kind of protect and, and, and embrace the world. And we also need the people who can see the potential of making business and live from it and make some income so we can make things and make ends meet somehow in this and try not to be in opposition to each other, but try to work on the same platform. Uh, and, and let the leaders lead and let the business guys uh, do business. And, and hopefully we can end up having a sustainable development uh, pattern made out of these uh, two powerful insights. And this is exactly a group of hippies and business guys. And we are visiting a wind, wind manufacturer in Denmark and buying all some of our offshore wind turbines. We did a lot of purchasing and negotiations with companies then. It was so interesting to be there. And the hippies, they felt very scared about making contracts and signing things here also. And the business guys, they had kind of lights in their eyes of kind of, we are now in business and we're doing things. We are action, we are in, in, in business here. But we grew from it. We learned that we could we could be more courageous together. We could do things that we didn't, do before and therefore it became kind of a movement more than just uh, some individual actions in this also the community grew uh, and became more courageous because we took on the the, the contracts ourselves 
And we built and structured things here also, and I won't kind of pause so much on that, but we ended up having kind of offshore wind turbines also. And I think you see them in your neighborhood now also in, in, in America. And, 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 and these installations, there will be more and more of them. And we have to learn to live with them somehow and find ways to organize them so they don't spoil what we love and they don't kind of make, make neighbors fight too hard. We need to find ways to organize this so we can live with them because they, they, they are, we, we, can't, we can't make the energy structure without them uh, as we speak here also. And they, 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 don't, they don't take up so much space out there in the ocean. And, and actually they serve as reservoirs now also or reserves for biodiversity. Below this, there's 20 meters uh, uh, of, of water. What is that? 60 feet, feet 60 foot of water in, in, your, in your language. Uh, and in this, this is all covered with stones and rocks. And this is kind of a new barrier reef or new uh, underwater reef. And we have a lot of fishing uh, growth there. It's fishing prohibited all around the, the, the installation. And there's a lot of mussels there. I, every summer I go out and pick mussels on the foundations and enjoy a mussel dinner uh, with, with, uh, with wind grown wind uh, mussels. I don't know what, what you can call them. Um, and, and, and of course you see more birds, you see more sea mammals, uh, seals and dolphins uh, in, in that area. Why? Well, because there's more food. They don't hate the winter, but they like them because they produce food. And there might be some vibrations and some other, other uh, what do you call it, things with the wind turbines, but mostly it's producing more space for biodiversity, which I think is, is good at the same time as we're producing a lot of energy uh, with these wind turbines. We owned them in the beginning, we have sold them now, but in 20 years, we as a community owned them 20, um, 10 turbines uh, was shared by the municipality and private investors locally on Samsø. And we made quite a lot of money out of it. So much that we could actually buy electric cars and buy um, build this solar canopy in the municipality. So all public service cars are now electric and, and fed by uh, own produced uh, solar from, from the solar canopies uh, that we built from the profit from the offshore wind turbines. So it's kind of a food chain of investments that is feeding into the next endeavor, next uh, program we are doing here. And, and this is helping again the process because this is helping the local mechanic to, to, to be able to service electric cars. He'll buy the, the, the secondhand cars and sell them refurbished to local people so they can buy relatively cheap electric cars. So we have the highest number of electric vehicles in any municipality per capita in Denmark. So, 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 so it's leading to and then one investment leads to another process investment, which I think is it's another lesson learned from this also. When you get the, the financial aspect started, then it can feed a lot of other interesting things that we wouldn't have been able to do one by one uh, because we'd, we'd had to allocate the funding uh, elsewhere. So one of them came out is a sharing car system. So if you come to Samsung in a sailing boat or on foot, then you can lease a, an electric car. This is a secondhand uh, uh, old service car from the municipality that is now connected to wind powered ele electricity and you can rent it for the day or for longer just with an app on your mobile phone. So it, it, it works out fine. We have also, uh, you spend some of the money to buy a new ferry. Ferries are pretty heavy on, on carbon emission because they use diesel engines mostly. But this is a, a hybrid ferry. The propellers are electric and we use, um, we use gas. We are planning on a biogas plant. So all the waste, organic waste will be digested, produce methane and then pumped into the ferry as fuel here. And the next ferry we're going to have, we have two, one to the east and one to the west, is in two years time going to be fully electric, which is 160 cars, 600 passengers. So it's not a small ferry uh, and it's going to be a really big electric uh, connection that we need to make there, which will mean that we can then use most of the electricity produced from the wind turbines when it's not uh, used uh, domestically, we can use them. We can use them for industry and process and transport like this. A strong, sustainable and robust community must share locality, activity and mentality. I mean, locality is obvious. Activity is the plan and mentality is kind of the, 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 the recognition from the society in this process. How do you create a mental sense of ownership in the local community for the changes that is inevitably happening because of the plans that we have done here also? You can, de you can develop a resistance because people don't understand why we're doing it and then they become aggressively angry and in opposition to the change or you can invite them to participate and thereby create a mental feeling of ownership in the process and I think we did the latter most of the times because we understood that people can't just 
appreciate things they don't understand. So we have to kind of involve people, inform people, talk about it again and again, and tell the story about why we're doing it and share what comes out of it and what is the details of the process. We create kind of a bonfire of ideas and we gather people around these ideas and we talk about it in, a, in an informal uh, open-minded way where we can express ourselves as much as we want. I mean, you probably know how it is to, to join a barbecue. It's it's a little lighter conversation, especially if somebody brings beers and guitars, and then all of a sudden we have a we have a really good time, and we can talk about things that is a little bit problematic. If you're in a meeting room and talking with business people in in suits and tie, it it is a total different atmosphere. Uh, when you talk about things you don't really know about yet, you can ask more silly questions. And I think that is very important that there's time for that also before we go into business and action. Our positioning of the chairs determines the function of society, which again talks about how do we meet? What kind of meeting format do we have? Do we invite business people uh, or bankers and other people to talk about the development? I think a lot of people will be kind of they, they'll, they'll disconnect from that because they don't feel invited because they don't really understand how it works. So we sit in circles. We try to be, have open mind meetings and open space meetings. And we try to introduce new meeting formats where we, we try to, to communicate in new ways. And this is always interesting because all of a sudden you see new people talking and people who didn't say anything before they started communicating and talking about creativity and minds of change and stuff like that. So these are circular meetings where we put the questions in the middle and we start addressing what we think about the questions. One by one, we, we, we all have a chance to talk. And after the meeting has finished, everybody has said and expressed their opinion. If you sit in a normal structure where you sit in lines and with an with a expert speaker, then it's like a little percentage of the people who had a chance to talk here. Also. So it's also including people in, 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 in a positive process. We try to do it also sometimes. This is a little bit for fun. We, we said, let's show the world that we are the world on Samsu. So we made people in the village uh, hold hands around the local pond. <laughs> and they liked that for a little while. But then they, I mean, thought it was a little bit silly. Sometimes it is, but, but uh, that is a nice picture we use uh, in, the, in the presentations. We still use the circle as a metaphor. It's kind of an old Viking, but it's also old, an old native uh, people's uh, way of meeting. The circle is a strong metaphor for something that is united and organized. And I think this is something that we are we, we, we have really taken a liking on that because it, it is really working in a good way. Development goals, I mean, we commit to them. And I see people proudly use the, where the implements of the UN development goals and all these sort of things. And we can also recite that number seven is about energy and climate. And we are really much uh, into that, that one. But we also have the, the, the other ad, attitude that we think the development goals are also a little bit of a burden because they are very ambitious and, and they can be kind of a pressure on, on what you call it, what, what does that mean to me? How do we translate them and kind of put them into local action? I think we should take the development goals and study them and then translate them and make a language and a narrative that is more what, what we talk about in Cape Cod or at Cape Cod or, or on Samsø or wherever we are. And, and then reflect on in, in that way, instead of just saying, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm for the goals and I'm supportive of the goals. That, that, is, that is a little bit too, too theoretical for me. We have done this in many years also, and we're connected in, in a network of EU islands. And we just applied to be the leader of, uh, of, of the EU island secretariat. So this is more than 300 islands. It represents more than 19 million Danish, oh no, sorry, 19 million Europeans who live on islands. So it's not a little community, it's like a middle-sized member state. And we are hoping to, that all these islands will be living labs of green innovation. And hopefully it'll spread also, so we can invite you and Marta Svenjar and, and the Cape to be members of this network of, of community development processes around the world that wants to share and help and, 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 and improve and, and develop new ideas about how communities can be engaged in the transition. We, we work in Japan. So one of my Japanese friends, he, he wrote this book called Energy Democracy. It, it might sound a little bit romantic also, but energy democracy is actually taken from the Scandinavian cooperative ownership model, where we try to share the ownership and, and thereby also the responsibility for the change in this also. And I mean, just just to brag a little bit, I'm in America now, and, and the authority was so nice to say that I was recognized big time from many different sites. And one of them was that I was on the front page of Time magazine once, not, not in person, but as an image. Also, if you look at the top left 
It says Arnold Schwarzenegger, just under T in the Times. And with this very little ball or apple, and then you down in the middle, right under the E, it says Soren Hermansen. And my ball is like twice the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I, I, I kind of, that is one of my biggest, uh, what do you call it, <laughs> achievements in the world that I, I, I had the, the double size of Arnold Schwarzenegger, which I was really saying, that's something, I mean, must be over there with you guys. <laughs> I invited him actually for an arm wrestling competition on Samsung once he was in Denmark, but he never really accepted, accepted my invitation. Probably would have been beaten up, but just the occasion could have been fun. We just won, as you as Dorothy mentioned, the, the UN, develop, UN Climate Leader Award at the COP meeting in Glasgow lately. And now there's a new COP meeting in, in, in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt um, this coming November. But that was a great opportunity to, to present us again. So this is me and my mayor on the right-hand side. And in the middle, we have Guadalajara, which is a million uh, citizen city in Mexico. And, and the left-hand side is Paris, the city of Paris. So we are in good company here, like little Samsu with two uh, big cities uh, being the climate leaders of the world, which I think is a, another fine recognition for the, for the future of work here. So that was my little tour, tour de Samsu, uh, and I hope that uh, I didn't overdo it too much and, and spend too much time on it, uh, and that you got some of, them, some of my points uh, at, your, at your conference. I'm, I regret I was, I'm not there, but I, I will come there next time. Okay, and and we are going to fly you here, uh, Soren. So we want to talk about that afterwards. So I wish you could see the screen. I hope you can because there's been nothing but lights and hearts and exclamations and laughing and stuff like that that people have been sending their reactions. You have just really connected with all the folks that are watching this today, and you brought this down to the human level which is all of this change is critical to happen at the human and the community level. You've inspired us. We we do think the Cape and Islands are the center of the world. Um, and uh, you've given us a challenge, right? Uh, to move along and to achieve what Sam Su and has done and what you've done with the Energy Academy. So we're very grateful. We look forward to seeing you again. And, and thank you for just providing the most awesome kickoff to our conference today. Thank you, CERN. Wish you a very nice conference and all the best. Thank you for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you're getting lots of applause.